link to the original audio down in the description below. Now, on with the next episode. Chapter 8 Choose Your Enemies <sighs> Chaos cultists in the mines, Castine said. Her T-ball hitting the surface of the conference table in the command center with the emphasis of a bolt pistol. And the Eldar coming and going as they please, apparently. How the hell did they get down there in the first place? The cultists seem to have been using the palace for decades, Doctor said, looking distinctly green around the gills. He shot a sidelong glance at Amber Lee, who'd taken the opportunity to fresh up after whatever adventures had brought her there, although her clothes remained just as rumpled, not to mention a little on the fragrant side, as before. Clearly, he was finding the presence of a real-life Inquisitor just a few seats away more than a little intimidating. The governor wishes me to express her shock and dismay at this discovery, and I assure you of all our full cooperation in rooting out every last visage of this appalling heresy. Not in my department, Embley replied, beastly to his apparent bewilderment. But one of my colleagues from the Ordo Malleus will be arriving soon to take over the investigation. In the meantime, you'll just have to do the best what you can on your own. But how can we? Proctor protested. There's no telling how big this cult is, or how much influence its members have. What if they're in position to sabotage the whole inquiry? If I were you, I said, I'd start by assuming very. Lots, and they are, respectively, and proceeding on that basis. Get every investigator checked out at least twice by different people, and reporting only to the local operator's office. They're from off-world, so they're less likely to be compromised. Castine nodded. We're listening with them already, she said. In case they need warm bodies with guns, obviously. Local law enforcement and the defense force have to be considered compromised until proven otherwise. Obviously, Proctor agreed, looking far from happy. What can I tell the governor? As little as possible, Amberly said. No telling how far the taint has spread. Then, she relented a little. It's unlikely she's involved, though, she conceded to Proctor's evident relief. If she was, she'd have made some kind of move to gain the initiative by now. Instead of bleating for the Inquisition to come in and sort it all out for her. Unless it's a clear double bluff, I said, unable to resist the impulse to tease the man a little. But if anything, the remarks seemed to have reassured him. She's not that bright, he said. But keeping her sidelined is a good idea. She's not all that discreet either. What about the temple you found? Denovinch asked, looking even more sickly than Proctor had. Clearly the news that heretics had been running rampant in the depths of a mine he was responsible for had been far from welcome. And he sat as far from Amberley as he could glancing at her from time to time as though he thought it could only be a matter of time before she leapt out of her seat and shot him. Castine turned to Amberly before she answered the question. Griffin's platoon still guarding the palace, but I'm not sure if it's from the heretics or the Eldar. Either way, we can't just leave it there. Cleanse it, Barclow put in. Bring the roof down with demo charges. Dilvidge nodded eagerly, sizing on the chance to demonstrate his loyalty. My lads can do that, no problem. They can place the charges right where they'll do the most damage. I nodded, and he smiled queasily, grateful for the tact support. Our own sappers knew the explosives, of course, rather too intimately for my peace of mind in case of their commander. Captain Freder 
whose enthusiasm for detonating things was all too evident by every time he got the chance. But the mines would be far better versed in the local geology. Under military supervision? Castine agreed, after a moment's consideration. If that's all right with you, Inquisitor. Fine. Emberly agreed. The sooner the better. Shouldn't we wait for the other Inquisitor to get here? Bucklow asked. They might want to examine the site themselves. When we found similar pockets of corruption on Umbrilia, the Lord General had sent his own sanctioned psychers to poke around before cleansing them, although the Inquisition hadn't been involved on that occasion. Emberly shook her head. I've already had Vrakil give it the once over. According to her, there's psychic residue all over the place, but no actual warp breach. I don't know about you, but I'd rather keep it that way. It's my vote, I said, conscious that if that course of action had been signed off on by both the Inquisition and the Commissariat, Castine and the 597th would be comfortably insulated but from blame, if it all somehow went horribly wrong. Or the quill jugglers back on Coronas decided to throw a jurisdictional hissy fit. Then we better get on it. Bucklow tapped his combate. Captain Freda, get on a little demo job for you. The mine manager's lezzying. Make sure his pick jockeys know which end of the debt cord goes bang. He listened for a moment and turned to Delavinge. He'll meet you at the head of the shaft three and twenty minutes. Better get your team together. The mine manager jowls wobbled, a hive quake of consternation rippling across his face. Twenty minutes, that's barely enough time to get there, let alone. Then you better get moving, haven't you? Barclow said evenly. I'd expected Delvidge to make more of a fight of it, but he simply made a few sputtering sounds like an engine seer getting their first look at a vehicle Jürgen had returned to the transport pool. Before rising, bowing elaborately to Amber Lee, pointedly ignoring the rest of us, and bustling out. Well, that takes care of one problem, I said, although I didn't believe it for a moment. Chaos cults didn't just go away, although the fact that this one had apparently been lurking down in the dark for years without sparking any of the civil unrest, which generally presaged an open declaration of alliance did point to the fact that they were relatively small and weak, as these things go. We'll have to get all the other minds checked, of course. Of course, Amberly agreed. She turned to Proctor. I take it you can talk to the right people to get that organized? Once you've worked out who you can trust. I think so, Proctor said before catching himself, no doubt reflecting that even though making from... Consummates was anathema to the carrier bureaucrat. This was hardly the time to sound enthusiastic about purging heretics. That is, I can. It'll take a while, though. Good, Emberly said. And we'll need to talk to the Arbiter about searching the hab zones, too. Particularly the Underhive. Where there's one nest of heretics, there could easily be others. I'll do that, Barclow said, an instant before I could make the offer. It wouldn't have taken me long to establish the need for regular Lesian meetings, which would have kept me in the warm, away from airborne Eldar intent on killing me, and even further away from any taint of warp craft, pretty much indefinitely. I've been keeping channels open with his office ever since we arrived. Good, I said masking my disappointment with the ease of long practice. That just leaves the Eldar to worry about, then. That it does, Castine agreed, turning to the Horolith projector, which had been wheeled into the conference room. By a couple of sweating troopers and a nervously hovering tech priest, before our deliberations had got properly started, the tangle of natural fissures at the bottom of the image had been extended a little. I noticed at once, presumably as a result of the exploration teams we sent down there, 
and who were still diligently burying away. Judging by how much had been mapped since the last time I'd seen the display. Casting glared at the glowing image as though personally affronted by it. And the biggest worry by far is how they got down there in the first place. Amberly coughed, looking faintly embarrassed. I'm afraid that's probably my fault, she said. Perhaps you'd like to explain that? I asked. Without the civilians present, Castine added, with a meaningful glance at Proctor and the engineer currently poking at the horolith. The cogboy took the hint and scooted off at once with a backward glance at the horolith, which might have seemed worried if they had not enough flesh left to register a facial expression with, no doubt wondering how well the delicate mechanism would stand up to Brocklow taking a crack at the controls that turned out to be necessary. Proctor, however, remained seated, bristling in the only way a fronted bureaucrat can. I have a report to the governor, he said firmly, and I can't do that properly unless I know precisely what it is I'm not telling her. <sighs> Fair point, Emily conceded. She turned to a praising eye on Proctor, but you can't unhear what I'm about to tell you, and I can assure you you'd rather not know. What sounded like a self aggrandizing hyperbole to the administratum drone but which sent a shiver of apprehension up my own spine instead. I knew her well enough to know that she didn't exaggerate when alien threats to the Imperium were concerned, and would do whatever was necessary to neutralize one, regardless of the consequences. I'll take the risk, Doctor said, a trifle stiffly, while Castine, Barclow, and I shared a glance of mutual apprehension. Clearly, whatever news Amberly had to share wasn't going to be submersible in a cheery greeting card. Amberly shrugged. Fair enough, she said, but this information is to remain strictly confidential. If anyone outside this room hears about it before I'm ready to tell them, up to and including the governor, I swear by the throne that I'll have whoever's responsible executed. Are we all clear on this? Castine, Bucklow, and I simply nodded, seeing no reason for a more elaborate response. After all, we knew one another well by that point, and if Amberly trusted the other two a little less, because she hadn't had so much contact with them over the years, she certainly had plenty with me, and my confidence in them carried its own guarantee so far as she was concerned. Proctor, however, evidently felt he had a little more to prove, because he followed up with a nod, with an audible gulp. Perfectly clear, he said, and ran a finger around the inside of his collar as though it had just become far too tight. Good. Ambly rose and approached the hololith, zooming the image to encompass the network of neutral passageways, where we found the Eldar and the heretics waiting for us. The Eldar got into the mine the same way my team and I did, through the webway. She glanced at Proctor, waiting for him to interject and ask what that was. But he must have remembered our previous conversation on the subject, because he simply nodded thoughtfully. We thought there might be an entrance to it somewhere on the surface, he said. But all the sites we searched came up blank. I nodded too, which begs the question of why they've only just started using this one, instead of a year ago when they first started reading. Amberly positively squirmed, although only I would have known her well enough to see through the facade of unconcern she continued to project. Because I suspect our using it was what first drew it to their attention. She paused, marshalling her thoughts. The webway is a peculiar place, with its own rules. The more energy you put into moving, the faster you seem to go. It certainly felt like we were walking for a long time while we were in there. Although, some of the passages are big enough to take a starship through. That must be how the raiders are getting into the system, Barclow said, since they all seem to originate from the same point. 
Amberly nodded. Along a passageway leading to their craft world, she confirmed. But now we've shown them a new path, one they'll be sure to exploit. Why didn't they know about it already? I asked. If their primary target is the mine on this moon, you'd think they'd have done it with their recon. Amberly sighed. Because the webway's fragmented, she said. This branch only leads to one place, although when we enter the portal, there we sense other pathways leading off from it. Sensed? Proctor asked, clearly out of his depth by now. Can you be more specific? No. Amberly answered, her voice a clear warning not to pursue the matter any further. Perceptions get distorted in the webway. If we hadn't had a psycho with us, we might have never found our way out again. I see, Proctor said in a voice of a man who manifestly didn't. And you were able to breathe in this labyrinth through the warp. Obviously, Amberly said, an unmistakable edge of tenseness, which I had long learned to be weary of entering her voice now. Otherwise, we'd be dead. Air probably leaks in from some of the worlds it's connected to. I said hastily, trying to keep the discussion on matters of relevance. Proctor frowned in puzzlement. Then why doesn't it leak out again through the entrances leading to open space? He asked. How should I know? Amberly snaps. It just doesn't, all right? Does anyone here actually care? Castine, Baklu, and I exchanged careful, neutral glances. And after a moment, she went on. Proctor finally having had a sense to shut up. No. Good. Then you need to get on to Subsector Command and call for reinforcements. Of course, if you consider it necessary. Castine said, with an air of a woman juggling hand grenades. But if you show us the location on the portal, we can just blockade it. Those tunnels are neutral choke points, and the Eldar can't get anything larger than infantry through them anyway. Pulling them off once we know their lines of advance will be a tracky shoot. Amberly manipulated the controls of the Hololith, marking the end point of one of the new passageways with an Eldari-looking rune. It's here, but that's not the point. The point where the other end comes out. Which would be where? Baklow asked. Emily twiddled a few knobs and thumped the control lectern with her fist in a matter of assured as a properly sanctioned tech priest. The image vanished to be replaced with the representation of a solar system we currently are in. The star at the center, the inhabited planets, moons, asteroids, and void stations are marked with runes showing their populations, economic output, state of readiness against attack, lamentably low in all the uttermost nearest to the Eldar fleet, and other such information, which, with us far out on the periphery, facing a constellation of enemy contact icons, I am found, Embley said, zooming the image in on the system's capital world. Hanging in space like a ripe ploin, teeming with people and graved with wealth. One of the biggest manufacturing centers in the center subsector. If you don't count the Mechanicus Forge Worlds, 30 billion people turning out everything from bane blades to boot soles. Disrupt that, and you're looking at economic collapse on half the worlds in the cluster. Famine, riots, rebellion, and the Tau poised on the other side of their border to swoop in and pick off the juiciest. We could lose a dozen systems to them in less than a year, and that's just the best case scenario. I shook my head. Best case scenario is that none of that happens. Why should it? Why now? Emily looked grave. Because the Elder have recently rediscovered a webway portal on Iron Found, down in the swamp of the Mine Hive. 
To cut a long story short, they claimed the planet long before the Imperium even knew it was there, and they're not happy about how it's been redecorated. They want it back, and... Oh, look! They got a raiding fleet already in the outer system. God, Emperor, Castine said, and Amberly nodded. My sentiments exactly. Right, Buckler said, homing in on the tactical issues with his usual directness. We need to send a message to Iron Found to get the Planetary Defense Force on full alert, and whatever system defense assets they've got deployed in the outer defensive line. Castine nodded decisively. And get there ourselves as quickly as possible. She glanced at Amber Lee for approval, and, finding it, returned her attention to Bocklow. Find an astropath. Let the rear echelon Grox Foddlers on Coronas know we need reinforcements for Iron Found, and to back up their defense forces here against the Eldar and any heretics that might still be running around loose. She turned to Proctor. Bind us a ship. Right. He looked a little taken aback, but rallied quickly. I'll get right on it. He bowed, mainly at Amber Lee, and started for the door. It might take a while. Most of the ones in orbit have their cargoes assigned by now. Then tell them I sent you, Amber Lee said. Better still. She tapped on her comm beat. Flicker. Scavenger. Proctor's just leaving. I asked him to run a little errand for me, and I'm sure he'd be grateful if you and Zimalda went along with him to smooth his path. Thank you, Inquisitor. Much appreciated. Proctor bowed again, with the air of a man who just poked a buzzsaw to see if it was still running, and was now and was trying to catch a couple of loose fingers. I'll get back to you within the hour. It's still going to be tight, I said. I turned to Amberly. Could we use the webway to get to Iron Found? She shook her head. That's... that isn't an option. We had to collapse the tunnel leading to it before we came through, even if we could work out how to activate the portal. Your advance party would just be trapped in a cavern in the slum. At least we won't have to worry about having the Eldar invading upwards through the Underhive then. I said... Not in the short term, Amberly agreed. Although the Eldar are one of the oldest and most sophisticated races in the galaxy, I'm pretty sure working out how to use a shovel isn't going to be beyond them. Alrighty. And there we go with another chapter for Choose Your Enemies. A little on the shorter side because I am a... Uh, Doing a lot of crap, honestly, and it's stupid. I got work, I got a whole bunch of stuff going on in life. I got uh, different games that I'm working on. I got the TF2 board game that I'm still working on. I got the uh, my version of Warhammer that I'm doing. I got my own version of D&D. &D. I got my own board games that I'm working on. I got this, I got that, I got that, and this, and that, and that, and whatever. Yeah, it's honestly just a lot of dumb stuff going on about right now, so eeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeeee
Let us go on with saying thank you to the ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. Mr. Craftsman123, Coca-Cola, Zach Keller Coffee, Meltdown480, Eldrick Maldonade, Forces Uno, Nicholas Gurr, Lilac NPC, Starboard, Thompson235, Azuth89, Josh Sickles, and Angela Nicholas. Thank you all for being ongoing Patreon support members of the channel. If you want to be a Patreon support member of the channel, you can too in the link in the description down below. Join the Discord, see funny things, uh, go through these different comments, see what books I actually have in storage as of now, and soon I'll be posting a poll to see which story you guys would like to see next. Well, not really a poll, it's just going to be a question as to what story the Patreons would like to see next. Or if they would just want me to continue reading what I am currently doing. Which is after a certain amount of chapters of other books, I do a Kaifas Kane video and then I do three other videos. Kaifas Kane, three videos, Kaifas Kane, three videos, Kaifas Kane. That's the new thing I'm going to be trying to do for this one. I'm going to be throwing in a lot of short stories. One where, um, well, let's just say I made a community post about it the other day. There are a few short stories about a specific type of people in the Imperium that I wouldn't mind reading. And some other stories that are on my list as well. Thank you for watching another one of these videos. I hope you are having a wonderful day. You're amazing. Never forget that. And I hope you have a great day. Until next time, I'll be seeing you. Goodbye.